The New York Association of Clinical Psychologists presents The Mind's Eye. Hello, viewers. I'm Dr. Herbert Robbins, your moderator for the Mind's Eye series. Would you believe that cigarette smoking improves health? that overeating prolongs life, and that getting drunk sharpens thinking? Of course not. So, why do people do it? Well, today our panel of expert psychologists will be discussing this and other such questions as the mind's eye focuses on addictions. So, stay tuned. <laughs> Dr. Herbert Robbins here for the Mind's Eye. First, I'd like to introduce you to our panel of expert psychologists. On my right is Dr. Daniel L. Uh, Yalisov. Did I pronounce that correct, Dan? Excellent. Right okay. on. Okay. <laughs> uh, Dan is a New York State licensed psychologist in independent practice here in New York. He's also an associate professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and um, a visiting adjunct professor at NYU a postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, if I remember the entire title. That you got it. Okay. Uh, he was the director of the Cabrini Alcoholism Program what, for 12 years, right? Yeah. And you've been involved in the treatment of alcoholics for 25 years in your independent practice. Boy, I've got to hand it to you. Not everyone can do that, right? That's tough. He's written several articles on alcoholism and, it, and has edited the book, which I hope you will show, called The Essential Pe Papers on Addiction, published by NYU Press. Is that available in Barnes & Noble and other stores? Yes, it is. In Barnes & Noble, it's a, uh, it is a technical book. I'm writing a more popular book now, but okay. uh, this would be for the professional audience, All basically. Right. Your second book is what, The Clinical Guide to Alcohol Research? Yes. And that's that's a, a popular book? It will be more for the popular people because it's a book which discusses all the research on alcoholism, which is phenomenal. It's, it's okay. a wonderful body of research. Mm -hmm. And the problem is it hasn't been applied to treatment. So my job is, or my goal is, to explain how the research can dispel some of the myths about addiction. Sounds like a great idea. I, I can, I really, I hope I can get to read it soon. Well, uh, uh, you'll, you'll be one of the first to get my mailings. Great. <laughs> and on my left, Dr. Alain Gollum. Dr. Alain Gollum is our panelist in residence. She's a New York State licensed psychologist and psychoanalyst with an independent <laughs> practice both here in New York City and also in Warwick. Mm -hmm. Right? She's a um, editor, a film writer, and an author of a book Trapped in the Mirror, a wonderful book which has been doing well. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's available in Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, mm -hmm. whatever. And uh, that's about children with narcissistic parents. Yeah, children mm -hmm. of very self-centered parents. Right. Yeah. And uh, in addition, I know uh, Dr. Gollum is working on a second book. Do you have a title for it yet? It changes every day. Okay. Today is Choose Love This Time. Okay. Looking forward to that. Dr. Gollum has also been a film writer. She's been an editor. She's been a columnist. And just goes on and on. And at any rate, it's always a delight to see you back on the show, Will Thanks, Herb. Okay. My own credentials. I'm a New York State licensed psychologist and psychoanalyst in independent practice here in New York and a semi-retired professor at the City University of New York at Bronx Community College. So, listeners, we start off our show with a letter from one of our viewers, and uh, here's the one that uh, the panel and I selected. Dear Mind's Eye, my wife is complaining about my drinking. We're happily married, but any time I drink it all, she really flips out because it reminds her of her father who was an alcoholic. 
What can I do to convince her that I'm not an alcoholic like her father? Okay. Dan? Well, uh, this question raises a number of issues. And before we get into really answering the specific query of this man, uh, we have to realize that talking about alcohol, mm -hmm. talking about addictions, we all are sensitive about it. Okay. So that in the end, we want an objective answer, obviously. We don't want one person's opinion versus another person's opinion. So in this instance, yeah. you have the question, she, he, they, you, he uses the word alcoholic, for example. Right. Well, in reality, we all vary in our drinking patterns. And okay. two people may disagree about the effect of the drinking when, in fact, the person may, may or may not have a problem. It's just a question of reconciling these two views. Okay, but is there an issue about whether um, how objective either he or his wife is, is on is about this issue of alcoholism? Well, of course. I mean, what yeah, what do you think? well, I tell you, I just was getting past the question of whether the person is an addict, but the way I would deal with that, if it was so narrowly defined as I don't like to see it, mm -hmm. you could say to that person, please don't drink in my presence. And of course, that could make a lot of trouble if that person has to drink, has to keep drinking. If it's just an occasional thing, mm -hmm. I could see them saying, sure, you don't like it, I won't do it. It's like, you know, any other thing you might ask a person not to do around you. Mm -hmm. But of course, once you get into the addictive realm, then it becomes a real problem for that, that person. You know, I know for myself, I find myself often suspicious about people who say, I drink, but I'm not an alcoholic, though, of course, that could be. Well, I certainly drink, and I don't think I'm an alcoholic. Right. So we're, we're into a very loaded area, and that's why the essential ingredient, I think, in, in working out resolving this dispute yeah. is taking away the fire, taking away the heavy opinions. I mean, if, if the woman's father is alcoholic, then indeed, she may be uh, uh, very, very sensitive to alcohol and even the smell of it. Mm -hmm. So objectively, I mean, if this were a call-in show, we could say, press the button. How many of you think he's an alcoholic? And how many of you think she's off a rocker right. and she's just overreacting? And you probably get, I would guess, a 50-50 on it. Right. The reality is we have no idea. Right. It's, we don't know. We, it's not, so, so the trick here is, not to jump to conclusions, the trick here is to maintain a method of just looking at it and trying to get the facts. Right. So ultimately, we want to know right. how is she flipping out, how, how upset is she, and does she need help with her problem? Right. And after all, having an alcoholic father uh, can interfere mm -hmm. with one's uh, relationship with... Of course, in my mind, I began flipping through my mental file cabinet and thinking the dynamics that very frequently uh, women who had alcoholic, maybe, I don't know how frequently, but I've seen women with alcoholic fathers or other kinds of fathers often marry men very similar to their fathers. And um, then they end up complaining. If you have a, a father who is abusive, sometimes a, a woman will marry a man who is abusive. If she's had a father who's an alcoholic, she may marry a man who is like an alcoholic. So I think uh, you're right, Dan, that we would want to probably bring the wife in on this and say as well mm -hmm. to get some idea exactly what's going on here uh, when you say that you're afraid he's an alcoholic. How much is he really drinking? Exactly. Get her picture mm -hmm. of his actual drinking behavior. And right. then, then we can have some standard by which to uh, know whether his drinking is, fits within the normal range. Um, yeah, and also, <clears throat> you're talking about an external thing, about whether he is or isn't an alcoholic. And if he is not, and she's still oversensitive to it, then is the problem in her camp exclusively? Mm -hmm. And if he is an alcoholic, is the problem exclusively in his camp? And how do the people deal with a behavior that may be destroying one and upsetting the other? Elan, you know? I just want to make this clarification. Yeah. He may have a drinking problem mm -hmm. and not be an alcoholic. Oh, really? Okay. What's the distinction? The distinction is that an alcoholic is someone who really has like a disease entity. And they make up about one-third of people that have drinking problems. The other third, or the other two-thirds, I should say, we would call problem drinkers or alcohol abusers. Now, the alcohol abuser 
uh, may not have to abstain from drinking in order to recover. Only the alcoholic, the person who has a chronic pattern of excessive drinking over a long period of time, only those individuals really sh uh, uh, should abstain from alcohol. So he, this man, if he falls into the camp of alcohol abuser, may find a way to cut back on his drinking if indeed he does have a problem that's not established. So when you say abuser, you're saying it's not in the physiology of the person, it's just a habit. Yes. It's on a mental level. That's such a good right. way of putting it. Mm -hmm. uh, an alcoholic is yeah. someone who is physiologically addicted mm -hmm. to the substance, mm -hmm. whereas an alcohol abuser may drink heavily two or three times a week, mm -hmm. but he doesn't have that physical dependency. There's something that I've noticed in uh, some of the people I've worked with, and I wonder if you've noticed this too, that uh, it's often not the, uh, the problem of one person, but of two. Like, I've had situations where a woman will marry a man who doesn't show symptoms of alcohol when they first get married, but then she behaves, uh, in, for example, if he has a child, where he's no longer the only one. There's, um, there's a sense, I mean, not consciously, of course, of trying to compete with the baby, mm -hmm. and then trying to get attention by saying, look, I'm not, I'm not a responsible person either. And then there are also women who, I guess with the common word is an enabler, mm -hmm. where there's a lot of conscious complaining about it, but at the same time, unconsciously uh, encouraging the very behavior that she is mm -hmm. complaining mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In a certain percentage of cases, you're going you're gonna to get that. And one of the things that this couple might consider doing is having some joint sessions to go over some of these behaviors. And one of the most interesting things, that's, it's kind of a fun thing to do, is to say, well, let's look at this triad. That is you, your husband, and, and alcohol. And what was the courtship? What was the relationship of alcohol to courtship? What was the relationship early in the marriage? And why now are you bringing it up? Mm -hmm. And very often, it, it may be the birth of a younger, uh, mm -hmm. of, a, of a baby. No, maybe right, like a younger sibling, or, because right. he really becomes... <laughs> or it becomes could be danger, like a patient of mine was going out with an alcoholic. Uh -huh. She said it, he said it, they said it, and it was okay until he started uh, driving while intoxicated and got picked up by the cops, right, right. putting himself in danger, sees himself as heroic. You know, in bad weather, he takes the woman home all over the road. Cops <laughs> pick him up. He's going to go to jail. Right. And she is beginning to feel worried about whether she should be with him, although she was raised in a family of drinkers. Her grandparents drank. Her mother drank. Her mother smokes pot. Her okay. mother's boyfriend smokes pot. Everyone she knows taking drugs. Everyone she knows is on something. And it's very hard for someone to see the woods for the trees. You know, like, right. what is normal? Where, yeah. where do I stand? How do I, how do I know where I should be? And I, and I think, Elan, you're raising a very important issue that anyone who gets involved with cases like this, unlike a conventional treatment where you can sort of sit back and right. analyze and do insight, uh, very often with addicted patients, they are putting themselves at terrible risk and their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And we must take a firm stand and say, you know, first things first, mm -hmm. don't get into that car mm -hmm. if he's intoxicated on any substance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's just for self-protection. It's not a punishment. Mm -hmm. It's not a confrontation. Right. First things first. Dan, you may have had mm -hmm. better experience than I have, because when I've tried that approach, it often is very frustrating since the clients will frequently sabotage what I say, take it the wrong way, or figure they've had enough therapy, they understand everything now, and they never come back. Um, just taking it off alcohol for a moment, I had... Um